Yes, go ahead. Definitely. First of all, good evening, everyone. I hope everyone's doing great today. Um, before we start, I would like to introduce myself and my colleague. My name is Najah Khlaifi and my colleague is Moab. And first and foremost, our guest, Jude Al Harthi. Welcome, Jude Al Harthi. Thank you for joining us today. Ahlan, and thank you. thank you, everyone, for joining us today, uh, for our first uh, Salam Story session of the year 2021. I hope it will be a fruitful year for everyone. And... Okay, uh, I don't know, I'm hearing an echo. I hope everything is... Okay, so uh, before we start, I would like to give an overview about uh, today's agenda. Um, we're gonna start with an introduction with uh, Jude Al-Harthi. She's gonna present a brief presentation about her experience. And then we will have a brief discussion. And please, guys, if you feel welcome to join us in the discussion, if you have any comments, any questions, please do not hesitate. And then finally, we will have the Q&A. Um, uh, so again, uh, welcome, Jude, and I give you the floor. Thank you so much, Najla. Um, ahlan everyone and good evening to you. Assalamu alaikum. First of all, thank you so much to Salam for having me with you all here today and organizing it. I appreciate the efforts that went into this. And I'm very excited to talk with you all today. As Najla said, I'd like this to be a bit interactive, um, especially in the discussion of the q and I'd love to hear from you, uh, what you're curious about, what you'd like to know more about. Um, initially, now in the beginning, I'll give you a bit of an overview about what I do, but also just generally peace building. Um, there's a lot there to unpackage, so I'm going to try to uh, summarize as much as possible. Just to introduce myself, my name is Jude Wasal Al Harthi, and I'm uh, born and raised in Riyadh in Saudi. And uh, then I went for my studies. I mostly have a legal background. I studied my pre law, my bachelor's, and my master's in the UK, all focused on international law. And then I continued to work in international commercial law, so I come mostly from a corporate law background. But during that time, I always had interest and passion on social issues, international human rights, international law just generally. So I worked a lot on pro bono, helping social causes, working also in a social enterprise, a lot of volunteering. Um, maybe one of my favorite volunteering experiences is uh, me and my team won the Lawyers Without Borders innovation competition for creating a book, an interactive storybook for children in Tanzania to educate them on human trafficking. And I think that um, experience especially stands out to me because one of my hobbies in just past times is creative writing and reading. So being able to bring in one of my favorite hobbies into my knowledge on law, now to address these social issues and combine them together was very exciting. And then we were fortunate enough that the lawyers, uh, Robes and Gray Law Firm Pro Bono Department and Lawyers Without Borders both adopted the storybook and we helped them for years to develop the storybook. And also on the side of uh, the experience I've had, I've worked in a federal uh, California court in Riverside. And also I interned actually once upon a time in the UNDP office here in Saudi. Now, by one point, I wanted to take a leap of faith and leave international commercial law more into the kind of causes I was interested in. And I ended up working in a human rights law firm, LIDE, where I worked in a war crime case based in London. And from there, I actually moved on to my current position, moving to New York and working as an associate peacebuilding officer. I'm based in the peacebuilding support office under the UN Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs. So that's a bit about me. Now I'm just gonna share my screen and do let me know so that we can jump into the presentation. Let me know if we have any difficulties at any point. That's great. Can you see the screen? Perfect. So starting by just giving you a bit of an overview about the UN, I'm sure all of you are familiar with this. I mean, it's an international organization and it kind of introduces itself, but actually it's a big system that quite often not many understand what's going within it. So to help you understand how the UN works and just all these topics that they work on, where is it exactly stationed within this big system? I wanted to quickly have an oversight about the structure. So first of all, uh, maybe the most well-known about the UN are the six organs. And the six organs are the General Assembly, the Security Council, all those councils that you often see on TV, where you see countries coming together to work on international cooperation on some of the most important issues. But 
as a matter of fact, also the ICG, the International uh, Court of Justice is also a part of those six organs. And when you think of member states, currently there's about, um, if I'm correct, 193 member states, countries that are part of the UN. Of course, Saudi Arabia being one of them. And this is great because you can see that it becomes a platform for all these countries to come together, to cooperate, to work on the priorities that they have. But also keep in mind that the UN isn't only, the UN tries to facilitate and help countries, not only on an international level, but also on a local level. And by that, I mean that the UN also works with people, NGOs, civil society organizations, businesses and private sector. So it really varies who the UN cooperates with and brings into these most important topics that at the, as on the world level, we need to address together. So it's all stakeholders together, all hands on deck kind of mission. Now bringing it into also the 15 specialized agencies, the 15 specialized agencies also belong to the UN family and uh, they have their own independence. For example, there's the World Bank, there's also IMF, ILO, all those actually, exactly. in, sorry, I thought there's an echo. All those, uh, as a matter of fact, originated from the UN but have their own independency as an organization with their own mandate. And then we have lastly the funds and programs. Funds and programs, I'm sure all of you are familiar with because you see it everywhere. Funds and programs also are a part of the UN family, but again, have their own heads of heads of organization, have their own financial system, their own mandates to work towards. So example, UNDP, UNFPA, UN Women, UNICEF for the children, UNHCR for the refugees. So that's kind of examples of funds and programs and agencies. And then you have, for example, where I'm stationed, that's the Secretariat. That's the Department of Political Affairs and Peacebuilding belongs to the Secretariat, and that tends to be the most uh, political body. Same goes for OCHA, the Humanitarian Organization, and OHCHR, the Human Rights Organization. All those belong to the Secretariat. And then where you could find the UN, really, HQ. HQ exists in New York, but also in Vienna, Nairobi, and Geneva. And then you have field offices all across the world. For example, the one we have right here in Saudi. So now that we have that covered, we can jump into thinking of the work of the UN. So this is just a snippet that I took from the 75th anniversary for the UN, that was in 2020. Now the UN is 76 years old in 2021. Um, so like I said, it's you can see already some of the elements I've mentioned that it's on international cooperation in the interest of both the country and the people and all the other sectors that we work on. It's widespread work. But really when you zoom into the UN, the work that the UN does, there's three main pillars that the UN works on. That's peace and security, where I'm stationed on peace building issues, development and human rights. And what I mean by that, that almost all the work you can see by the whole entire UN family has an element of these issues somehow linked to it. So that's helping you see the framework that we're operating with. Now, often you'll hear people say that peace building, what I work on, is a cross pillar work. Cross pillar meaning that it, it covers all these issues. Peace building can be a big field and it's difficult, to, not difficult, but maybe to say complex to um, navigate it. And uh, I often, at sometimes I see people, I, I can see that even in writings or publications, there's almost a tendency to assume that almost anything can be peace building. But there is a niche for peace building that although these issues are like human rights and development belong to peace building, but that's an element within it, not necessarily peace building itself. I'll go into it a bit more later on just so that we can really zoom into what do we mean by peace building. Okay, so right now you can see in front of you a couple of images. This is a bit of interaction. If it's fine, just uh, write in the chat, what's the first word that comes to you when you look at these images? Okay. So what I was trying to do here is I can, I, as you all can see, you can tell maybe when you look at the, uh, these pictures that there's um, really issues when it comes to poverty, maybe security, war, hunger, development. There's a lot that you can see in these pictures. At the end of the day, it's conflict. And conflict can almost, almost really be about anything. And I tried to really select as many um, widespread pictures as possible. I mean, for example, you can see that there's uh, the picture uh, with the plant, right? Because also environmental issues can be linked to peace building. Poverty is linked to peace building. Resilient economies 
also are linked to peace building. So it really does vary. Now, to keep things also optimistic, what do these pictures inspire you to think of? You can just think of keywords and write in the chat if you like. Great. So I can see that you're already thinking alongside of uh, exactly diversity, happiness, education. Brilliant. So that's really the work of peace building. It can be about issues when it comes to education, accessibility, empowering the next generation, family. Everyone wants to have security, family, someone to support them. You can see there's a picture of maybe a grandchild with his grandma right there in the right corner, and that's bridging the gap between generations, learning from each other, communication. There's a table filled with women empowering gender and inclusivity. You can see there's also a picture of these skyscrapers as tall as it can reach, and that's really about resilient economies that citizens can come together to support their own community. So that's brilliant. Moving on to the next slide about peace building. Now there's a lot to unpackage here, but I'm gonna try as much as possible to really summarize it. When you think of peace building, we just kind of so within these pictures, it's really about how can we, right? Go from this to this. How can we transform the conflict? Now, peace building, when do we see peace building coming in? Is it at any stage? Is there a specific stage of time? In fact, it can be at any stage. It can be at an active conflict. That's a situation where we're managing conflict. Right now, for example, in any country in the world, if you're seeing um, any kind of protest or war, that's an active conflict. How can we minimize the damage? How can we manage this conflict? That's where conflict management really comes in. But peace building also comes into post-conflict maybe after 50 years, after six months, after 100 years. Some countries that have went through genocide, the generations after it still do recall that time. So post-conflict also comes in peace building to work on reconciliation, bridging the differences, trying to create social cohesion. That's also a part where peace building plays in. But in fact, peace building can also come in the very beginning, the very first stage before we reach the point of active conflict and post-conflict. It can be preventive work. And for me, to be honest, all of it is interesting, but I find prevention work especially interesting because imagine this, how can we already prevent conflict that we don't know? How can we make sure, how, how can we visualize the future and already predict something that could happen in 50 years, 10 years, 100 years? So prevention work is really vital and it's difficult to also evaluate it because how can you evaluate what's not there yet? But again, it's super interesting because when you come to prevention, think of actually the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 goals, zero hunger, gender equality, education, economy. I like that I once heard that these SDG goals are actually a prevention framework. If, and yes, I'm being optimistic here and I'm a bit of an idealist, but I think you need to be in this line of work. Imagine if all those 17 goals can come through. <laughs> Thank you. Um, down the line, if all these 17... Could we please all make sure that um, the microphones are turned off? Thank you. So where I left off, so the SDG goals, imagine this, if all the 17 development goals down the line could come true, then maybe possibly we'll reach a point where there's no need for conflict. And prevention work is really sensitive work but it also ensures that we are already ensuring that one day we can have a peaceful society. So thinking also of peace building, peace building, like I said, can almost not necessarily be about any issue. It needs to have its niche. And that's because the UN agencies and the UN funds and programs all have their own mandates, some that work on empowering women or refugees. But peace building also has issues when it comes to empowering women or refugees. However, we really need to find our niche in the field because there's so many projects that undergo on development and on helping societies. And you need to make sure that you're really zoomed into the conflict to capture that peace building niche. And I'll give you a bit of an example. For example, uh, when it comes to climate action, there are in certain countries and rural areas where communities have land disputes that's causing there to be escalation of violence between these communities. There's a need for a peace building uh, solution there, even though that's essentially an environmental issue. 
Also, when it comes to refugees, if unfortunately the refugees are not reintegrated into a society, they're not included in a society, they're not empowered, that's a lost asset to a community that could have gained from the diversity. That's also an issue of peace building. So I want to kind of give you a better example by helping you understand how do we then transform a conflict into a positive thing. It's really important to understand that peace building should be locally led. Having local solutions where the people themselves in that community that struggle with this conflict can become change makers. They can own the solution, locally lead it, and that it can be as tailored as possible to the local needs. Why? Because that ensures that we're not just building peace, but we're sustaining peace. It should be a long-term impact. And frankly, peace building is a long-term effort. I mean, maybe yes, in certain situations, you can solve something in a year or two, but down the line, because these are such sensitive issues and you do want long-term impact, it should be a long-term process. So thinking now of peace building, maybe the work that I do. So I work on peace building projects and to give you a, a picture of what, the, what happens really in peace building projects or essentially, I don't wanna get too much into the nitty gritty of project design because then it will become too technical. But the first thing is to analyze the conflict, evaluate it, understand it. That's looking at the conflict drivers. What is driving it? Why was it here in the first place? What's sustaining this conflict? What's the root causes? Because thinking of conflict, there is, it's so dynamic. There's so many layers to it. And I mean, just think of it. Think of any issue in the world. It's not one or two things that have caused it. It could have been a piled up of issue of many years of certain negligence. Maybe it spiked up overnight because of something. There's so many triggers. Unfortunately, even though I wish we could solve everything, you do need to create a practical and efficient solution. So that means really selecting the primary conflict drivers, doing an entire study of it, and then just selecting the ones that you feel that are at most risk, selecting the target group that are at most risk, and then designing the solution around them. And for me, I think the second stage after we analyze the conflict is always the most interesting, which is designing the project, designing the solution. And that's because you can, um, and that's because it's such a team effort from almost all the different stakeholders, as is with any project. You would have consultations with the target group first. It's also all kinds of stakeholders locally. You might partner up with local NGOs, charities, youth centers, women's centers, um, and all these local partners ensure that it is locally driven. And of course, we partner up also with the government ensuring that this is something that the country themselves believe in. Um, and it gets, after and it, it's, it takes a lot of months. It takes a lot of months to design this project. Um, but once we have as much input as we can as possible, and then you polish it up, like I said, you really zoom into that niche. You pick your also zooming into the solutions because solutions, they're so diverse and it can be several solutions. But again, it needs to really be responsive towards the conflict drivers that we've picked. And from there we think, are we actually managing the conflict? Are we transforming it? Are we preventing something in the future? Trying to give it all sides of the peace building work as much as possible, but ensuring also that it's catalytic, it can be scaled up. Because again, projects eventually do end. And as I said, you want a long-term impact. So is this something that once this project ends can be catalyzed by the community, can be owned by the community themselves? Um, and then comes in the fun part, which is monitoring the project, getting to see it grow. And at this stage, it's uh, monitoring the project is really about analyzing it continuously. If it's meeting the milestones, if it's meeting the needs of the target group, how are they responding to it? And do you know, I'm sure you can imagine, but during COVID-19, many of us struggled because COVID-19 exasperated all type of social issues, not just in peace building, but all in the other areas, whether it's development, whether it's human rights, whether it's peace, whether it's security. And we saw that already those who unfortunately struggled with poverty now have struggled with even more poverty. Those who str uh, struggled in having any sort of accessibility to basic services now struggle even more. Food security, food security is also now even more of an issue. And in fact, um, there's a recent study, if anyone's interested, that's been done by UNDP on the SDG goals. All the SDG goals where we were making progress, unfortunately now we've went back several years. And this is, I'm not saying this to um, add a negative tone to the conversation, but really to say that it is more important now than ever 
that we stop, reevaluate the progress we made, reflect on it, and pick up the speed again. It's more important now that we bring into peace building, youth empowerment, women empowerment, development, all these kind of issues and topics now after COVID-19, hopefully after COVID-2020 even, it, it becomes even more vital for us to focus on these issues. I don't want to take too much of time because I'm sure that when we start uh, conversing, there's more to say about this. But it's also to understand that at the end of the project, then we would evaluate its uh, success, its progress, um, and its success and progress. And then we would basically just evaluate the lessons learned from the project. What did we What did we do that was successful? What failed? All these are super important for us to then bring into and feed into the next project cycle. And then uh, one thing I did also want to highlight about COVID-20 or COVID-19 and the, the world we're into right now is inclusivity is one of the top issues we're struggling with when we're thinking of all the recovery plans, when we're thinking of peace building solutions. And that's since, as I said, that not only has uh, this pandemic exasperated social issues, but those people that often were left behind or marginalized are finding themselves now in even deepened lives of divisions. So you'll see that in the future, there'll be even more patterns of working on marginalized groups. There's a lot that I can say, but I wanted to really uh, provide maybe a few resources for your own research. Um, there is so much content and peace building online, but maybe some of the few that I would recommend is there's Pathways for Peace report that World Bank and my Department of Peace Building Support Office have worked on. And there's also actually the Peace Building Fund Secretary General reports that come out annually. And that actually is well, you'll see that all the peace building projects that I'm talking about. Um, so you can even get a better picture of what kind of peace building projects are out there and what does it mean to have a peace building project that tackles environment, that tackles refugees, women, youth, inter-ethnic tension. There's also the peace building commission documents and that's really peace building commissions where member states come together. So that's mostly the diplomatic part where I thought you could see how the international cooperation on peace building really happens. And lastly, you have the whole department of political affairs and peace building affairs strategic plan. And that's more to give you a bit of an idea of what are we focusing on now in the future? Where are we looking into to work on? What are the most important areas, priority areas that are of most concern? And at the end of this presentation, I was asked uh, to also maybe uh, talk about some of my favorite projects that I've worked on or so some of those that I found most interesting. I think all of them are quite interesting um, and very important work, but maybe my own preference is I enjoy the youth empowerment projects, it's essentially when you're really giving them the power to become peace builders themselves. And that kind of projects is where we see um, youth created, we're creating space for them to speak with the institutions, the local institutions, to express their own priorities on peace building, their own concerns. And you really see that you're giving them the tool for them to influence their own futures. And that's extremely empowering. And that has long-term impact that I don't think any evaluation can really capture. Thank you all very much. Um, I'm looking forward to the next part of the conversation on cultural communication and your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for everything you said regarding peace building and, and your whole experience in this uh, in this regard. So um, my colleague Najla Yudas. Okay. Uh, I think Najla have a technical issue. Okay, do you hear me, Najla? Okay, so uh, just to get back to uh, uh, to our conversation and uh, uh, to continue more, uh, we just we just wanna we went to to, to uh, give us some brief and, and some uh, ideas regarding your projects when you come to work uh, in peace building and some of the experience that you had in your actual work, whereas peace uh, uh, building take uh, initiative to uh, help uh, some society and specific society that you work on. So if you give, if you give us a brief about your specific uh, experience and some projects in that regard. Thank you, Maad. Um, so maybe rather than giving specifics, just because um, it's maybe best that I'll keep it a bit general, if that's fine. 
But to give maybe a few, uh, some of the work I do, as I said, maybe prevention work. So one of the areas I'm also interested in is prevention of violent extremism. And um, it sounds serious, but essentially, as I said, prevention work is really trying to understand the groups or the communities that are at threat of being marginalized or not having access to education opportunities down the line. If you think of it just in general, really, Unfortunately, when we see the trends of those, um, I guess that the trends of those that would be labeled as potentially criminals or those that unfortunately have caused the conflict themselves, when you look at their backgrounds, they might have not just had the similar privileges that many of us have, simple privileges such as education, protection, uh, safe households, um, basic access to services. And it's really that marginalization that causes, unfortunately, down the line for them to be radicalized or to commit any kind of crime or conflict. So for me, I, I do enjoy the prevention work because as I said, it's really complicated to try and assume what might happen in the future and already to think of the, whatever is bubbling up when it comes to conflict and try to choose to focus for, let's say, let's, um, I mean, there's also, I'll give you an example of a project I found interesting is there was a prisons, essentially a rehabilitation center. And unfortunately in one of the countries, one of the prisons set up didn't have a family visiting room. So many of these prisoners never had the chance to be visited by their families, to communicate with their families. Unfortunately, when they would return to their homes at one point, the reintegration process back to their community, back to their family was, was a struggle. And so trying to create better social cohesion and trying to also empower them to return to their societies and become an asset to their family, an asset to their community. It, it's as simple as um, in the project we created, for example, what we constructed a visiting room for their family to come to prison. And it might sound like such a small thing, but really for me, I think no big or small effort really goes to waste. And that gave them the chance to be visited by their daughters, their mothers, their wives so many times. And I think that eventually helps them when they return to their community feel that they've already been in process. And of course, there are other initiatives in providing them education, providing them certificates so that they could have an easier reintegrating process back to their communities. And again, that process really in the bigger picture helps the entire community, not just this one individual. You're helping the whole community benefit from someone now that is empowered to support the community. I see that Najla is back, so I'll pause here. Yes, we will uh, get back to Najla. But uh, before that, I, I totally agree with you when it's when it also came to the small uh, 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 level and with that you talked about when we have and a small initiative that might create a, a major change in society on a certain society. So I totally agree with you, but now we will get back to Najla to, to carry on. Thank you everyone for being patient. I'm sorry, I had some technical difficulties. Um, thank you, Jude, for the great presentation. I think we have a similar work, but my side is from the development side. And it's really interesting to see the peace building side. As I volunteer in the United Nations Development Program, I understand the, the level of the planning and the budgeting and the critical thinking depending on the projects, but it's really interesting to see it from a different side. Uh, therefore, I have just a one question to, to know. I would like to know your experience or what do you think, how can cultural communication adds to peace, peace building? It would be really interesting to know how do you think it will add. Uh, thank you. Over to Thank you, Najla. Um, so that's a great question. Um, so cultural communication is also a part of peace building, and that's one of the tools that ensures and empowers peace building generally. To kind of explain a bit more, cultural communication is a soft power, but it's a very influential soft power because when I mean, there's a positive side and there's a negative side that, on what it tackles on what it can give. For example, cultural communication really when you're bringing in these two different communities, right? Or cultures, or even just simplifying it to individuals to talk to each other, to communicate, to have better dialogue, creating a platform for them to finally listen. Really what you're doing here is you're transforming and changing perception, you're changing behavior. And a lot of peace building work when we work on, even if it's just as simple as youth empowerment environment, women, all of it is about really changing that that individual changing that community. And it's very complicated. It is complicated work to 
change perception, to change behavior, so that we can have as long-term of an impact, we need to ensure that they themselves have accepted this change. They themselves have led the change. Um, so that's where I feel that cultural communication comes at most handy. I'll give you an example of um, one of the projects I once worked on is, so these two countries unfortunately have a history of conflict and therefore these communities grew up um, there was microaggression between the communities, even though this is post-conflict setting, we're talking after years and years when the conflict have passed, but it continues. You can see, um, you know, hate unfortunately is carried on from generation to generation, misunderstanding, stereotypes, and all this, and all these could eventually for thinking in a prevention work where cross cultural communication come in, it can be a preventative tool because once these communities understand each other, you're possibly stopping a future cultural, um, you're stopping a future domestic violence or clashes between them. And in fact, we're seeing a trend of cross-border clashes and violence happen. So one of the projects I once worked on is to create, uh, to create kind of this initiative and in bringing people together as a platform from both of these different communities. I think it was fascinating because it was the first time that these two different communities sit together. Imagine this, it's the first time you meet someone from that different culture. They've never had the chance. So both of them have all these ideas and thoughts about the other, they're different, that's the enemy, that's the other side. But for the very first time, they actually met each other. Um, it was all facilitated and guided where there was a chance for them to express their, ex their concerns their own priorities on how we could create a reconciliation plan. Again, this is them voicing out their opinion to feel that they own and lead the solution. Um, a chance to give them to also just clear the air on misunderstandings. And this also, if you think of it, when it comes to cultural communication, this really prevents hate speech. And again, we're seeing an escalation, unfortunately, of hate speech. And hate speech, essentially, it can be on social media, it can be in person. But again, hate speech ensures that these lines of differences are deepened. And the more of these lines are deepened, the more we're seeing further differences and marginalizations, and it just keeps getting worse from there. Because if you think of it also, whenever a certain group or community are marginalized, like I said, down the line, eventually they might be, it might cause them to commit conflict. And not necessarily is there anyone out there who wouldn't want the same thing we all do. The words you all expressed, happiness, education, security. But if that marginalized groups feel that they are left out by their community because of hate speech or because of misunderstandings and there's a lack of communication between us and that community, it could cause conflict. So the positive side of cultural communication is it's one of the most powerful tools for social cohesion. Over to you. Thank you, Jude. Uh, thank you, thank you. And I see a lot of good questions in the comment section. Um, we could pick a few questions. Um, this, is, this question is from Fernandez. How can one ensure or promote peace building among, uh, among vulnerable groups or in local regional uh, authorities when um, operation comes into play by the, later, by the latter? I believe this is a really good question. And uh, if you don't mind, over to you. Great, thank you so much, um, Georgina, for the question. So this is this is a big peace building topic. It's one of the most active uh, things we work on because, like you said, um, sometimes there are certain vulnerable groups, and really vulnerable groups is quite wide term. Vulnerable groups I've seen in certain projects be people with special needs. I mean, they're just automatically, unfortunately. Uh, left out of a conversation because of their special needs, right? So there's a lack of accessibility for them when it comes to education, up job opportunities, having a family. Like I said, it's automatic from day one of their birth. So in that area, we would, I mean, to give you a few examples, we would review policies, ensure that the national policies are as inclusive as possible of them trying to give them visibility when it comes to all the kind of regulations that the country has, but also the country working with private sector, the businesses themselves to understand these vulnerable groups that they themselves are not aware of and how maybe they could target their own recruitment into empowering them. That's a bit of peace building work. Um, and then coming to the part where you, I'm just gonna look at your question once again to make sure that we're covering it all. Okay, yeah, oppression comes into play by the latter. 
it is that this is why I mean often with marginalized groups, they're just left out. It, and, you know, even it's, it might be a bit funny, but it, well, I don't think it's funny, but maybe at 2021, people would assume it's not. But youth and women are continually in every society also viewed as a vulnerable group. But what I'm trying to say here is that these vulnerable groups, like you said, maybe they're oppressed or left out of a conversation or may, it goes unnoticed. Um, they actually, and I've seen it, they can become the most important tool towards peace building. Because if you're creating a diverse society where everyone in it, whether they're refugees, whether they're female, male, they are a recognized asset within the society and they tomorrow could start businesses. They could uh, lead, they can support the economy. They they themselves can become champions. Um, This is a book that I quite liked reading, but it's it's not necessarily linked to peace building. This is where my own (laughs) side interest comes in. But during Brexit in the UK, I was so I was based in the UK when Brexit occurred, and I could see a list. I mean, everyone could sense that society in an odd way was being divided, even though all of all of these people have been living at harmony for so long. So uh, there's a book that came out called The Good Immigrant, and it's to show that immigrants are essentially an asset, and that there's there's so much that they do in their own communities that is good for everyone. And maybe this doesn't necessarily um, link to your question directly, but I think indirectly for me, I always think of that book as a good example of how a certain writer saw a conflict happening in their society, used their love of creative writing to bring in stories about immigrants and educate everyone through the love of reading about how it's an asset for us to be such a diverse society and very different from each other. So maybe that's one of my own um, non-related to work favorite examples of how someone who isn't necessarily a peace building um, professional managed to create a positive impact. Thank you. Thank you, Jude, very much. Uh, I think now we would like to take a question. One of, uh, please raise your hands. We can unmute you if you have any question that you would like to ask Jude. I see people writing in the comment section only. Um, Okay, we can take another question. Um, This is a good question from Ahmed Yagoub. What are the expected risks resulted uh, from lack of coexistence? Thank you, Ahmed Yagoub, for asking. Over to you, Jude. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, so that's a little bit also linked to Georgina's question on vulnerable groups, right, is again this friction that might exist between communities um, and the lack of coexistence. What are the expected risks? Plenty, I, I suppose, um, but it, it can be plenty and this really where I mean, this really can be per, uh, linked to the prevention work I spoke about, where we, if we see such a severe lack of coexistence in certain different countries, then that could raise the worry of, are they finding it difficult to work together, to collaborate, to have social cohesion? Um, this down the line might mean, I mean, for example, in unfortunately, in some communities where there's a high level of racism or discrimination, you could even see that if you have a local store, people might not even come and purchase from your store because they know it's owned by you. So that's economy being affected. That's so it's just to show that it's not only that lack of coexistence affects the general fundamental values of humanity as a society. Are we kind to each other? Do we understand each other? Um, But it also can affect economy, definitely, and the way we operate with our businesses. Can people equally thrive, equally and creatively? That's where we're going to lose creativity. If all of us and our differences can pitch in startups and ideas and economy will thrive and become a more resilient economy. But it's not only there. I, I think of it also when it comes to what we're teaching future generations, future generations that eventually could collaborate on different initiatives and different ideas. And... Then I wanted to also take your question of coexistence on more maybe from a local level to an international level. We all know that unfortunately the global narrative on media might not be as accurate about different cultures. Um, And it's that maybe sometimes on media, um, 
I mean, just an example could be too focused on certain countries. But then when you discuss with the younger generations about other countries, they might not even know where to point it out on the map of the world. So this child now is, is either too focused on a certain region and missing out on the wealth and riches of cultures, different rituals, different religions from the other societies. That simple act of omission means that maybe in the future, these countries will struggle with tourism because internationally, they're not as well known, they're not as well recognized, people don't understand them as much. So there might be a lack of opportunities for trade, for tourism, even maybe academically. Um, I, I studied in SOAS University, which is the School of Oriental and African Studies. And it's a great university if uh, you're interested into Middle Eastern politics, law, ideas. And when I studied there, you'd expect to, to have a lot of people from the Middle East, but in fact, it had many people from around the world who were fascinated and they wanted to learn more about the Middle East. And that's a good example of showing you how coexistence, even on academic level is important because all of these students eventually had all these ideas and, and things they wanted to bring in here to work in here and help different communities evolve with this positive example of diversity. So it really does vary. Coexistence is important academically for us all. It's important for trade, for tourism, for us to understand each other. It's important to influence media and also for us as a community to own the global narrative that exists about us out there. And for us to learn more about the other countries out there that often we don't see mentioned as much. Thank you. Thank you, Jude. We have another question from Ilham. Um, hello. Yes, please go ahead, Ilham. Hi, we can hear you, Ilham. Yes, go ahead. Yep, uh, sorry, I muted myself and then it muted again, I don't know why. But anyways, uh, thank you so much for this great talk, Jude, and thank you everyone for making this happen. Uh, my question is about, um, so you mentioned some activities that can really help people communicate and understand each other when they have very like wrong backgrounds about each other. So you mentioned like the activity where people from different backgrounds was, was, would set together and have a conversation in order to understand each other in a deeper level. I really love those activities that you mentioned, but I feel like there are people who are that have really, really deeply ingrained ideas who are not even willing to even listen or engage in those activities to understand the other side. So do you have any suggestions about how to make those certain um, uh, demographic understand these things and how to bring them about uh, peacemaking and being open to other people with different backgrounds? Okay, thank you so much, Alham. That's a very great question and it is a sensitive topic. Like I said, changing perception, changing behavior, changing mindsets is, is some of the most complicated work out there really. And because it is a long-term work, it's not essentially something you can, because also the perception that that person has about the different group is also of a buildup of long-term work. Um, in the beginning, I said that I wish we could work on it all when we talk about conflict because conflicts have such complicated layers to them and they're not caused just by one or two things. But you really have to zoom in as much as possible to that specific issue, to that specific target group and to also those that are most willing to cooperate. And so Ilham, when it comes to these situations, we have had projects where we've come to realize that unfortunately it might not even be the individual themselves. It could be their school, it could be their parents, it could be their friends. It even could be the content that they consume from TV, social media. So there's a lot of ways that someone could be affected without realizing it. Um, and so we do have projects where we've worked on, um, or not only actually the UN, in fact, there's brilliant NGOs and charities out there that work so much in charities uh, on peace building or even locally led initiatives. And those are sometimes even more important than the work the international com com uh, community does because these, if those local initiatives happen, that's locally led and locally owned. Um, so as I said, so one of the examples is where a school had to review their curriculum to revise how they're discussing different cultures. Another example is when a community in a, in a, a community in a rural area 
where we worked with the community leaders, the religious leaders also, because the religious leaders would be maybe more accepted by that community to be listened to. So it's also trying to find your special entry point. Who would these people listen to? Would they listen to Jude or would they listen to their local leader? So it's also trying to really know how to tap into them. We've also worked on creating a youth organization where we brought in parents, actually, even though it's a youth organization, it was having sessions between the parents and young people themselves. So bringing in the parents into the issue because they're not only a part of the problem, but they're in fact a part of the solution. And that's why I wanna highlight that all these vulnerable groups, all these marginalized groups, all these difficult people that might accept what you're offering them. In fact, they're the most important because if you can break through the wall, if you can break that wall of perception and transform it, that's gonna be the longest term impact. Some tools I'd suggest for you is to break it down step by step. Often, rather than jumping directly to try and create that table and bringing in these different communities together, there's a lot of baby steps that need to happen beforehand. Do you need to, for example, review school curriculums? That's a brilliant first step might take them to read the school curriculum a few years before we're ready to bring them back to the table. Do you need to actually maybe create, um, I'm trying to bring it down to a very small level, but maybe a school club actually, or just a community club where those who are willing in the first place to come together, maybe a social media account, a blog where you're discussing this, hosting webinars, a podcast. So trying to slowly prepare people to accept this idea rather than directly creating that table, bringing in the different cultures and saying, talk to each other. That could be too much of a shock. So do try to find your special entry point. And this is when you're analyzing the conflict, Elham. So that's your really first step to it. And different solutions work for different communities. I've never seen one project be adapted exactly the same in another community. That never happens. It needs to really different sizes for different cultures, different people. So you really have to tailor it as much as possible and work on taking as many consultations from those difficult people themselves, tap into them, talk to them. And it will be a lot of effort, but I've seen it happen eventually. Thank you very much, Jude. I think uh, we can conclude with the last question from Taha, from the comment section. He says, uh, there are social protection framework that can be easily adopted by other stakeholders so they can address these issues while designing initiatives and projects, for example, an impact assessment tool. Okay. So, uh, Taha, thank you so much. That's a great question. Um, I have to say that the UN does create a lot of toolkits available online. And so I would take my time in reviewing. I mean, it really does depend uh, if you're trying to look at a framework that maybe tackles specifically youth, women, development, humanitarian. Like I, I would encourage you to get familiar with the UN agencies. Uh, for example, if you're looking into um, UNDP often because they're, uh, the, they're one of the largest uh, agencies the UN has, they have a lot of toolkits online. So I would encourage you to take some time to look at the toolkits available. Otherwise, there is the OECD um, evaluation also toolkit to see. And lastly, there I'm not quite familiar with them, but I've actually seen their work here and there. There is the Youth Peace Builders Evaluation Organization. They're not in any way linked with the UN, but um, I've seen them a bit here and there on social media. And uh, I think it's a great initiative to make youth themselves become the evaluators of these solutions. So maybe you can get some ideas about assessment there. But it, 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 from experience, it is difficult to evaluate and really capture the change that you've made. It's, um, it's, there's always room for improvement, but there's great efforts going in there. Thank you. Uh, I think that gives it all. Thank you very much, Jude, for being here today, for giving, you, uh, giving us your time. And thank you everyone for attending today's session. We hope to see you in another session and thank you very much. Thank you, Jude. On behalf of everyone in Salam, on behalf of Dr. Fahad Sultan, we uh, really thank you for joining us in this session and uh, for giving us uh, this great uh, presentation and also this uh, great thought uh, regarding peace building. Uh, uh, we uh, really hope it's not going to be inshallah, the last time, but uh, uh, it was in a great uh, session. So th thank you all and thank you, uh, Jude. Any last thought, any, any conclusion to the, this session? 
No, thank you so much, uh, Najla and Muad, and uh, thank you also to Salam for having me. This was really interesting, and it was a lot of great questions. Like you said, hopefully not the last time. I do encourage everyone to reach out. If you have further questions, you can find me, um, I mean, everywhere under Jud W. Al Harthi. So wherever you are on social media, feel free to reach out if you have further questions. Always happy to be of help. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.